morning. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Welcome at home. It's great to see you. How lucky we are to be alive right now. What a week, huh? <laughs> Pretty exciting times. Uh, maybe this was foolish, but I stayed up till I think 2 a.m. Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. We don't have cable, and our little antenna network thing doesn't work that good. So I only have uh, access to NBC. So I hang out with these guys for, I don't know, six hours. Uh, the last boy kind of conked out about 10.30 and left me by myself, and so I kind of alternated between watching the news. And they did a great job, by the way. It was very, very well, uh, good coverage. And the guy with the map and the counties is always pretty exciting. And so between watching that and refreshing my Twitter feed and maybe building my own Excel model on what I thought was going to happen with the numbers, I didn't actually do that. That was not a, I thought about it, but I didn't. And after falling asleep a few too many times in the recliner, uh, the president had a little press conference at 1.30. That was enough for me. Went off to bed. And then uh, the only thing we knew at that point was that General Bacon had handily won re-election. So that was very exciting. I was very happy to see that. And he's a good, good man that we know. And I uh, was very happy about that. And sometimes I do forget I'm in my mid-40s. So dragged myself out of bed. It was 7 a.m. I was exhausted, bleary-eyed, couldn't really see straight. And... I uh, was already, took a little longer to get ready for work, was already a little bit late kind of running in, but I was like, I'm going to run through Starbucks. Today is a Starbucks day. So, so I cruise down, I get on my app. This has been one of the few things about coronavirus that has been good, is you can order anywhere on an app now. You don't have to talk to anybody. I love it. It's like you just order, it's in there, no talking, uh, and I like not touching people that I'm not related to. That's nice too. That's a different story. So I put my order in, I cruise down 72nd and Dodge, roll into the Starbucks, and I get in the parking lot, and I see Sandy walking out to his Jeep right there in the parking lot. So I pull over and kind of off to the side there in front of Chipotle. And first conversation I'd had post-election night and just had a really nice conversation with Sandy. And, man, what's going on? And did you hear about this? And what do you think about this thing? And, you know, just kind of that back and forth. You guys probably all had that same experience Wednesday morning that we're following it close. And so we talked for a little bit, still a ton unknown. Nothing was known at that point. The only thing I think I felt confident in is that Michigan was going to matter, depending on where Michigan went. That seemed like that's where things were going to go Wednesday morning, which they did. And kind of as we get done and we're walking out, Sandy says, well, the good news is God is control of all this. Amen. Amen. That's exactly what I felt walking out of there. We serve a living God and Elections certainly have consequences, they certainly matter, but we don't fear as believers like the world does. Regardless of your side of the aisle or your color, red or blue, or progressive or conservative, or whatever you think, we trust in the creator of the universe. He has plans to pro prosper us and not to harm us. He cares about you, he cares about me, he cares about the president, he cares about the president-elect, which is official now, right? Mostly official. He cares about General Bacon, he cares about Mrs. Eastman. He cares about all of us. He loves each one of us so much that he laid down his life, that you, that me, that they might spend eternity with him, with no elections. Thank you, God. I can't tell you how much that quick five-minute conversation lifted my spirits, a chance encounter with another brother in the Lord, and just a reminder of God's grace, a reminder of God's faithfulness, a reminder that, that the whole world might burn. We stand fast on the word of God. We are in week six, of Act, week six of Acts. What a book. What a time to be alive for them. Another time when believers, they had a choice. They had a choice to fear, or they had a choice to trust and to stand firm. We're going to go through two passages today. First, we're going to do the sequel to the persecution that Trevor went through a couple weeks ago. We saw in chapter four, the apostles dragged before the court. So this is the sequel to that. And like most sequels, it gets a little more intense than the last one. That'll be the gift of suffering. That's the first part. And then we'll see how the early church thought about leadership. And that's the gift of serving. So those are our two points today. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you that you're on the throne. We thank you you're good enough. We thank you you care for each one of us, Lord. We thank you that nothing surprises you. And Lord, though men are good, bad, Lord, that we do things with integrity or not, Lord, that you're in control and we can trust you. And Lord, we just pray Lord, this morning, for a spirit of unity to be upon our church, Lord, and our families, and Lord, that we would just lead the way in uh, pointing people back to you, and Lord, we do our civic duty, and at the same time, uh, we would recognize our status as citizens of heaven, first and foremost, and Lord, I pray you just use this time, Lord, uh, to stir up our hearts, and Lord, just these stories we see in the Bible really happened. 
Lord, these are real people that really did these things, Lord, and we just want to grab a hold of that. We pray to use your word. Use your Holy Spirit, Lord, just to stir up in each one of us what you'd have us to do. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, chapter 5, verse 17. That's where we're going to start. If you've got a Bible, a paper Bible is great. Electronic Bible, that's fine as well, too. I'll be in the ESV. You can follow along. Chapter 5, verse 17. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. So right before this, remember Jim last week talked about Ananias and Sapphira, and the uh, Apostles are out healing people. They say they even put people out in front of Peter so that a shadow would come over him that they might be healed. So that's the background. Filled with jealousy, we get kind of the answer in this passage right here. There isn't a mystery. If you've ever wondered, what is wrong with these religious leaders? I run into that sometimes. What is wrong with these dudes? Like, what are they doing? They knew the word. They led the church. They were supposed to be men of God, right? But what'd they do? They crucified the Lord. He rose again. They saw those same men again. And the guys that ran from him 40 days ago are now out doing miracles. They're preaching all this awesome stuff. They say, don't do that. It's bad. Stop. Then they do it again, and they're doing more miracles. And then the religious leaders again will see the gay try to intimidate them. The disciples get back to work teaching and healing again. And the word is jealousy. They cared more for themselves, their own position, than they did for God's word, than they cared for God's people, then they cared for God's church, and that's what they were supposed to be in charge of. Keep in mind, this isn't envy. Envy is wanting what others have. Jealousy, according to Webster's, is being hostile toward a rival or one believed to enjoy an advantage. That's the problem here. They can't stand that somebody else is getting noticed and they aren't, right? This is the religious leader's dirty secret. They only cared about power. They only cared about themselves. And now we see the disciples with a completely different message, right? Over here, and the religious leaders, they can't stand it. It's totally separate. The disciples and their message were in direct opposition to the religious leaders, and that was the problem. And the more success that the disciples had, the angrier the religious leaders got. Again, because it was against them. Verse 19. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go. Stand in the temple and speak to the people all the world words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. We got a lot more verses, but we really could just finish here. Like this part of the story is awesome. Don't skim through this. We've all seen it before. It's easy to just run through it. An angel busted them out of prison in the middle of the night without even opening the doors. And why did he do it? We see it in verse 20. Speak to the people all the words of this life. He broke them out for a reason. If you name the name of Christ, you've been busted out of jail. Why? For his purpose, to speak to the people the words of this life. I have come to give you life and give it abundantly, is what Jesus says. These apostles, man, they had no fear at this point. And again, remember, this is like six weeks ago. They're running and hiding and locking doors. They had no fear. They went right back at it. And where did they go? Right back to the temple. I found this quote from the great Charles Spurgeon. It's a little passage here. This is really good. So follow along here. It is clear from the text that they were to take a conspicuous place and speak boldly. Go, stand in the temple. Go where the Sanhedrin holds its sittings, where the high priest and his Sadducean comrades are on the watch. Let not the danger hinder you. Go where all you can see you, stand up and stand out. Wherever the people are, there let your voices be heard. Be there perseveringly, taking your stand and keeping it until removed by force. The object was was to make the gospel known. Therefore, let them go to the headquarters. Let them stand in the chief place of concourse. Let them be in the resort of the devout. Let them challenge the observation of pilgrims from every corner of the land. Brethren, it is not ours to hide in holes and in corners. Our gospel is like the sun, I love that, whose line has gone out through all the earth. Let us not speak timidly, for we have not received the spirit of fear. Neither will we hide our candle under a bushel. We are to publish the tidings of that life from the dead, which has brought life for the dead. This is our calling, people. This is why we are studying Acts. 
This is why we're working through our T for T and practicing our evangelism, why we're doing our 15-second stories, practicing those three circles, and thinking about how we can share the gospel, to speak to the people the words of this life without fear and without hesitation. All right, rest of the verse. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. They didn't know they weren't there yet, right? And again, this is, they got all the people again. I think Trevor shared last time, it's like Congress, Joint Chiefs of Staff, the president, every religious leader. So they went and grabbed all of them and said, go get those dudes. Didn't know what we told them to do. But when the officials came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported. We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them. Yeah, the duh. And wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, look. So they're wondering, where'd those guys go? Guess where they went? <laughs> they went right back to headquarters, bro. Look, the man whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set before them the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, Hey, guys, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name. You hear? We, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. What about the jailbreak? Why didn't they ask the guys about that? Hey, how'd you get over there? <laughs> what happened? You guys were here, and then now you're there, and you're back in there? The doors were locked. What's wrong with these guys? Oh, yeah, it's jealousy. Remember, they're blinded with their own foolish ambition. They don't care about easy that, any of that. It's easy to look down on them, but I'm sure if we're all honest, we can find a time where sin has made us stupid as well too, right? And we're in the car. We see the cliff coming. Should probably slow down, maybe pump the brakes a little bit. But instead of doing that, we push on the accelerator and go right over the edge. And that's what these guys were doing, right? But Peter and the apostles answers, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. So again, this is what Peter responded last time, right? Although last time Peter was a little bit more, um, I don't know, conciliatory. Like he was trying to kind of maybe broker a deal or maybe he was uh, a little more kind with them. And this time he just gets right at it. And he says, no, I, I kind of told you once already, right? We're going to do what God says. And oh, by the way, you guys remember you killed Jesus. Like, I just want to make sure that's clear that this is what happened here. That's why we're doing that. I told you already. When they heard this, they were enraged and they wanted to kill him. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. Uh, according to historians, Gamaliel was actually a Pharisee, so he's not a Sadducee like the rest of the guys. Some historians, I don't know if it's most, maybe 50% of them, believe he was actually the son of Simeon from Luke, one that waited to hold Jesus. He was, he's certainly the son of a Simeon, whether he's the son of that Simeon or not. There's a little bit of debate. And we see later in Acts, they're pretty sure that he is the same uh, Gamaliel we see that taught Saul. So that's the same dude. And it's interesting because these are Sadducees, and their big deal, right, was the resurrection, um, that they didn't believe in that, which is why they were so concerned with Jesus actually coming back to life. And the Pharisees were a little different. So now Gamaliel's kind of uh, brokering a little bit of peace here. Verse 35. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thedius rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or if this undertaking is of man, it will not fail. But is of God, you will not be over to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. What's the definition of insanity? You guys all know this. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. 
The religious leader's response reminds me a little bit of ineffective toddler parenting that we've all been there. Kid goes to do something, you say stop. They do it again, you say stop at this time. They do it again, I really mean it. Don't make me get up, I'm gonna come over there. Anger, tears, rinse, repeat. We've kind of all been there, right? That's what they were doing, guys, for real this time. I already told you once, don't make me tell you twice. Don't go back out there and do that again. Knock off this Jesus stuff or else. Now, even though Gamaliel's advice was prudent, they were so angry, but they couldn't help but have him beat, right? It's like, all right, that might be true. We might be opposing God, but we're so mad we don't even care. So they're going to get a beating and send them out. And, you know, we don't get a lot of details on the beating. Certainly possible. You remember the maximum penalty was 39 lashes. That's what a lot of people think happened. They got 39 lashes with, uh, with the whip. This was, not a, uh, this was not an inconsequential thing. This was something pretty intense and pretty serious. Near death, people died from that. That's why they had the 39 lashes, because you could die. Verse 41. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that is Christ Jesus. Man, I love that. It's the most challenging of the whole passage. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And this was not a, uh, this was not a minor dishonor they suffered. They suffered a very major physical torture and beating. That's so against our culture, isn't it? It's so against ourselves. We kind of want it our way. This week, we wanted our candidate to be elected. We wanted our view of how the world should work to be proven out to be true, right? They not only accept, accepted the suffering, they rejoiced in it. Is that your heart, friends? I think it's an easy prediction to make that the American church will come under more persecution over the next, make it up, 5, 10, 20 years, for sure. It's happening all over the world, right in front of us. These are a couple of pictures just from the last two years, one in Sri Lanka, one in China, of churches getting bombed, uh, or even that one on the right is getting torn down. The state tore that church down, and nobody ever heard from those believers again. They just kind of, they disappeared, right? What's our response today when things don't go our way? We're going to fight. We're not accepting that. We're going to go against that thing. I don't know. Maybe that's right. Maybe. I don't know. Or maybe God's allowing the persecution. Maybe he's allowing the path you didn't choose to come true. That we might be found worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Whichever path we are on, whichever view you take, there is one thing that is clear. We won't control the outcome. But what can we control? Anyone that's ever been on a sports team has heard this before. You can control on a sports team. What's your coach always say? Say aloud. Matt, what would your coach tell you? What are two things you can control? Yeah, what else? Ben? Twins? What would your flag football coach tell you? Attitude and effort. Those are the two things you can control, right? You can't control the outcome. What do we see in this passage? What did the disciples control? What was their attitude? They rejoiced in the gift of suffering. They weren't worried about the outcome or what the leader said. They rejoiced. And what was their effort? What did we see at the end? They went right back to work. Not only did they go back to work, they went back to the temple. The place had just got arrested, pulled in, whipped probably 40 times, and they said, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going back there tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. I'd be like, yeah, that's not a great plan, guys. Maybe we should go listen to this home church thing for a little while and, you know, maybe let things settle down and kind of see how things go. And we'll kind of take it slow and... Maybe next quarter we'll get back into that. Maybe we'll start planning a little bit and figure that out. That's what I would do. And what they do? They just went right back. They said, we're going right back there. And they rejoiced because they were serving. Why is that? It's the Holy Spirit. They trusted. They had the message that Christ, the Christ is Jesus. And they were not going to be stopped with that. So that's the gift of suffering. Amen for that gift, right? The gift of suffering. Love it. Now let's look at the gift of service. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, we're in chapter 6 here, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Man, why is this in here? We're talking about bread. Like, do we really know about bread today? How's this going to help us with our walk? That can be our thought, right? A little background, the Hellenists, they were of Greek origin. So they spoke Greek, may have been more Gentiles. The Hebrews they mentioned would have been the Jewish group, and that was where most of the church was at this time. They were the Jews. 
And so they kind of have a little bit of ethnic fracturing here, right? A little bit of different group, and you're a little different than me, and we're supposed to all be together in this church, but I'm not really sure about you, because you use different words and talk about different stuff, and you don't really care about my customs that I have, and I kind of know we're all Christians, but I'm a little bit uncomfortable, right? Uh, and so now the bad news, the good news is the group was increasing in number, but the bad news is we have drama now. Now we got different groups of people, and we got people yelling at each other. We got this yada yelling at this cat. We don't know why. Why is she yelling at the cat? He just wants his bread. Churches have split for far less than this. Some of you have been involved with it. You've seen it up close and personal. Style of worship. Who gets to be on stage? Who doesn't get to be on stage? Where we're going to meet? What time we're going to meet? What translation we're going to use? Uh, how we're going to do stuff? We're going to serve there or serve there? People have split up over these things, right? Preferences can drive people apart. But what do we see here? That's why this is in here, folks. This is a very real issue that uh, we want to see how the first century church handled this. And they handled it very well. Spoiler alert. And the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples, and they said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. But we... We'll devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. A couple of really good leadership lessons here. First, the disciples knew what their calling was, the apostles, right? They were called to preach and to teach, teach the word and to pray. That was their job. And so it wasn't that they didn't want to serve tables, but they had a job that only they could do. And if they didn't do their job and they took another job that somebody else could do, now they're not doing what God called them to do, right? Others could serve the table, only they could lead the church. Two, they brought the rest of the team together and offered a solution. They didn't tell them what to do. They didn't say, we have these seven guys, go do this. Hey, guys, we're kind of thinking about this. What do you think? Would you pick some men and help us out? We see later they say, everybody agreed, this is a good idea. Third, they explained their rationale, what was important to them. Hey, this is why we're doing this. We're not trying to get out of work. Our focus needs to be preaching the word and praying for you guys. Therefore, we need some help with this. And then fourth, they asked people to serve where they were gifted. So that's our heart, too. We want people in the right spots. We want people serving in areas that uh, you feel great about because God's gifted you that way. And he's gifted all of us differently. We couldn't all be musicians. That would not work out very well, right? And this year's been so encouraging because we've had the opportunity to give some folks chances to come alongside us and to work in areas they're gifting, and it blesses the whole church, right? That's our heart, too, for you to experience the gift of serving our Lord and the gifting he has given you. Verse 5. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. I missed this the first time, but I found this in one of my commentaries. What do you notice about those names? Not first evidence, but those are not Hebrew names. Those are Greek names. So again, the issue is a minority group of Greeks feel like they're getting mistreated by the Hebrews. And so they, who do they put in charge? They put the minority in charge. That's brilliant. Those guys are going to take care of it in a way that's fair for both groups, right? So it wasn't just a, a majority group. Can you imagine that happening in our society today? Probably not. Probably not. So I wonder what happened with this plan of theirs. We get the answer in verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. This is the best part. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. That's kind of stuck in there a little bit, right? It's a miracle. This could have been, like I said, the churches have split over music styles. This was the growing church, and they've got some very real ethnic, race, society issues all boiled up in there, and they got to decide what to do with it. Are we going to be unified? Or are we going to let those issues separate us from our mission, which is to preach the words of life, right? They handled it well, and they devoted themselves to the most important. Never let the good crowd out the great. Not only did the church grow as a result of this, but there was a miracle. The priests became obedient to the faith. So we don't know how long it was, but these are the same dudes that just whipped them. I don't know, two weeks ago, four weeks ago, six months ago, doesn't really matter. They saw this example, and all of a sudden, religious leaders are starting to come over. 
This is actually the last time you see that spelled out in the Bible where religious leaders came over to the faith. Right after the apostles handled a potentially group-splitting issue was when they saw the most growth and unity. And so that's kind of where I want to wrap up because it feels like we're in the midst of that right now, does it not? As a society, uh, maybe not as a church, but maybe as a church, I don't know. Um, division is all around us. And why does it seem so much worse than in the past? If you look closely, a couple of those pictures are right here in Omaha. My gosh, who would have thought of that in sleepy little Omaha, a flyover town with a bunch of farmers and insurance people and some banking and, uh, you know, what we do here, we're kind of we're Midwest, right? And our city was on fire for a while there. I'm sure you have your opinions about why. I know I do. But there's one thing that isn't an opinion but a fact. We have an enemy. I read an article by John Yates last week that my wife sent me. It's on the Gospel Coalition. Go Google it. Uh, it was a reminder that Satan is the great divider. He doesn't care about the issue. He just cares that we aren't together. Look at this quote here. This is so true. He's the divider, the devourer, the deceiver, the destroyer, the inspirer of disobedience, the invisible evil power who is manipulating situation, twisting truths, raising the temperature of emotions. Man, how does that sound like our society today? That fits in pretty good to me. And we've got an enemy, folks, that's out there. Hey, you got some verses for that, Pastor? I do. Next slide, please. Ephesians 6, when the day of evil comes, stand your guard against the divider. He is on the prowl looking for people to devour. 1 Peter, there is no truth in whatever he's involved in. John 8. He is the thief who comes to destroy. John 10. He is the inspirer of disobedience. Ephesians 2, that's the headline, right? Inspirer of disobedience. He holds people in bondage, Luke 13. He shakes people till they come apart at the seams, Luke 22. There but the grace of a God go I, go we folks. Guard your hearts. It's not just culture. It's not big media. It's not just social media. It's not just the Russians. Is that still a thing? I didn't hear anything about the Russians this week. I don't know. I guess we fixed all that. That's all fine. Here's the hard part. We have to work at unity. We, we, each individually, we make the choice to be humble. We choose to overlook an offense. We choose to apologize when we're not even wrong. We make decisions with the group in mind and not our own preference. That's the hardest part. Well, I kind of want it to be this way, and I kind of think we should do this. Uh, we're going over here. All right, now I got a decision. I'm just going to go somewhere else where they want to do what I want to do, right? You can do that, or you can stay in unity with the group. So the good news is, folks, we don't go alone. The author of life rolls with us. So let's lead the way here, friends, in unity. We'll wrap up there. Let's start with praying for our president-elect, all right? Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for today. I just thank you for your words. I thank you for Acts of the Apostles. I thank you for the boldness of these men who would not be stopped. They got beat. They got put out of society, Lord, and they just did not care. They went and they shared the word, Lord. I pray that would be our hearts. Lord, we would take this word to our friends, our family, our coworkers, Lord, with the boldness that you've called us to do. Lord, we do pray, Lord, for our society, this election, Lord. I pray we'd move, move quickly to get things resolved. Um, Lord, and I pray each one of us would have the right heart. Lord, we do know what you've called us to do. You've called us to pray for our leaders, Lord, so we'll do that. Um, that's a direct command from you, and I want to be, Lord, obedient to what you've asked me to do, Lord. I pray for the president-elect, Lord, vice president, their whole administration, Lord. I pray, Lord, you would just use them in a mighty way, Lord. I pray you would use them um, to advance your causes. I pray you just change hearts, Lord. Um, we know you can do that. I know you changed mine. I know you took me, Lord, from where I was at and put me where you wanted me, and we just pray that same thing, Lord. Help us, Lord, just change our hearts, Lord, if they're hard, if there's been disjustice done, Lord, we pray that would be exposed. Lord, we pray if there's any inequity, that would be exposed as well, too. And, um, Lord, but most of all, we just ask for a spirit of unity to bond this church, on our families, and on our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.